this. So over to you, Odin. What is it we're finding about the Quran? What is the Quran? What is this Nazarene reading of the Quran that you want to introduce for us? Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, what I, I want to do is to, to show the audience um, a very thorough Quranic study about the word Quran. W what do we get from the Quranic text when, when we read it literally? Um, when we look at every occurrence of the word Quran and the Arabic root of, of this word. And we will see that uh, from the Quranic text itself, we cannot, we cannot come to the conclusion that the Quran is the word of God that has been transmitted to Muhammad and so on, like, like you just said, like the standard Islamic narrative um, tells us. The Quranic text tells us another story. It tells us about a lectionary that was translated into Arabic by some teachers. I think those teachers were the Judeo-Nazarenes that we already spoke about in previous videos. And what those teachers did is um, they, they, they had some preachers, some Arabic preachers, and they taught them how to present the Arabic lectionary to uh, an Arab audience. And this is what we find in the Quran when we read it literally for what it what it says literally. But before before I came to this, I come to this before uh, I'd like to I'd like to introduce a sort of general uh, impression uh, of of the Quran. What is the Quran? What can we make of it when when we read it? So if you're ready, Jay, let me jump in the the first part of this presentation mm -hmm. and <clears throat> let me share my screen so jay the viewers what i want to tell you is that when you read the quran just when you simply read it you can already see that the quran is not a book it's, it's not a new uh, sort of homogeneous book it is a corpus corpus a latin word what is a corpus? A corpus is uh, a collection of different texts of different natures. So the Quran is made like this. It is made um, as a collection of various written texts with different types, different styles, different genres. In, in a way, we can compare it to the Bible. The Bible is much, much bigger, but the Bible is also a corpus. It is a collection of different texts. For example, the gospel are different from the Genesis book or the Torah and so on. And it is a bit, a bit the same with the Quran, but it is, it is complicated because everything is mixed together. And this is a, a very strange thing about the Quran. What we find in the Quran are sermons, proclamations, exhortations, homilies. So one could think it would be from Muhammad himself or for a preacher, from a preacher. We find also uh, legal discourses, instructional discourses. We find narratives um, that might seem to be preached or sometimes are not preached. We don't know exactly. And mostly those narratives are biblical commentaries or parabiblical stories and apocalypses. Apocalypses are stories about the apocalypse. We also see in the Quran that we have different narrators. Sometimes we have a, a preacher who is speaking a, uh, and who is preaching, but we don't know whether there is a unique preacher or several preachers. We also have a sort of teacher who speaks in the Quran. So, of course, for the Muslims and for the standard from, from the standard Islamic point of view, uh, the teacher is God himself. He says to the preacher, say this, do this. He sort of teaches the preacher, but actually we don't know whether it is God who speaks. Um, it, is, it is a huge claim to, to, to make. Uh, what we can, well, what we can say at the simplest level, at the basic level is that we see a teacher teaching the preacher. And we also have uh, narrative writers. Uh, texts that are written 
without um, a preacher or a teacher. And we also, we, we just have um, a narrative writer. Uh, in some passages of the Quran, we have traces of an orality tradition, which means that the, um, the passages are structured according to the Semitic um, oracular tradition. We find this, for example, in Surah 5. Um, in, there is a, a French scholar who studied this particularly, Michel Kuipers, who showed that in some passages we have um, an orality tradition, an oracular tradition, with a sort of uh, onion construction. You see, with the, an onion is made, on, <coughs> made uh, with different layers, and you get to the center, you, you have the layers and layers up to the centers, to the center, and in some passages it is a bit like, like an onion. You have the, the first verse, which responds to, uh, for example, the tenth verse, and then the second responds to the nine, the third responds to the eighth, and so on. And at the center, we have the pearl, which is the core of the proclamation. This is an oracular um, structure, an, or an orality structure. But in many of the passages of the Quran, we don't have this structure at all. We, we have just a scripture tradition. It is written um, like a text. But mostly what we know now is that the Quran as a book comes from a scripture transmission. So it, there might have been some orality tradition at the beginning during the time of the preacher or the preachers. But the book we have now is not, it's not the, 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 the writing of those homilies, of those exhortations, of, the, of those preachings. It comes from a scripture transmission. It has been edited, it has been modified, and it, it came to the Muslim as a book. Uh, this is why, what I, I just wrote in the presentation. And we have evidence of this in the Quranic text. Of, we have evidence of an editing process and a rewriting process. Um, I will introduce Guillaume these Quranic studies thereafter, but I can already tell that he found many passages in the Quran um, that, that were rewritten. And he thinks he has evidence of it because we have um, somewhat almost identical passages in the Quran, but uh, the first one is, is, is um, the first one is in a way, and the second one is almost identical, but some things have been changed. For example, by a writer who rewrote the passage because he did not understand he did not un understand what it meant. Um, Guillaume D calls this calls this the synoptic issue of the Quran. Synoptic, as in the synoptic gospels. We have, you know, Jay, that we have uh, three Gospels that are called the Synoptic Gospels because they kind of look the same and there are differences in between and the exegetes uh, work about the, <laughs> work this issue. I've been working on this issue since uh, centuries, but there is kind of the same issue in the Quran. There are many passages that look the same, but they are slightly modified. So, for Guillaume D, it is an evidence that uh, there was a writing and a rewriting process. Are there examples that you can give that we can show and look at of the synoptic uh, uh, parallels? I, I don't have them in mind right now, but uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I should do is prepare those examples for the presentation. Uh, for example, I can look in... I can, I, I, this is what I should have done, <laughs> is to quote the passages, uh, because this, uh, yeah, I guess this is what the audience will, will, will want to see. Um, two, two passages that Guillaume D worked on, um, it's about the creation of the world, and we found the almost identical uh, stories at, in two, two different locations in the Quran, and in, also in, in another location, in, the, in, the, in, those, in, those, in both of those passages, there is something about the balance. Just by reading the Quran, 
we can already see, see that as it is, it is not by itself a um, um, homogeneous book, and it is not a lectionary, because a lectionary is something different. And um, a lectionary is a, a religious book, uh, which contains a collection of scripture readings appointed for the masses and for rituals for worshipping. And it is done according to a ritual calendar. For example, the masses calendar, we <clears throat> or for the personal prayer or the collective prayer of the monks, for example. Um, the Quran has been said to be a lectionary because it is what the word Quran means or could mean. But by itself, what we see, it is, it is such, a, such a corpus, it is just such a diverse, uh, such a collection of diverse texts, it cannot be seen as a lectionary. Uh, it's, it's in, there is nothing in the Quran, there is no structure, there is no calendar, there is nothing to, to make it look as a lectionary, even though some parts of the Quran could have come from a lectionary or could have been adapted from a lectionary. So this is kind of a response, my response to, to Thomas about this. And also, as it is, I think, and this was my first reaction when I first read the, the Quran, that it is, I don't think it is a divine text, um, because it is so, so diverse, so bizarre, so odd, um, that I, I don't, I don't uh, fathom how God could speak to men like this way. And we see it in the Quran, God only speaks in some parts, or God or a teacher, I don't, we don't know whether it is God or a teacher who is speaking. And the divine origin of the text is only proclaimed in some parts, if, if and only if, we think that the Quran that is mentioned in the Quranic text is the Islamic Quran. And we will see in the Quranic study about the word Quran that uh, it is not the case. So <clears throat> let's take let's take um, a, a deeper dive thanks to scholarship um, into the Quran. And we will see, and the scholars have established that the Quran cannot be taken as a standalone book. It cannot be read without the Bible, for example. Um, Stephen Shoemaker, who is a teacher at the University of Oregon, uh, just uh, published uh, a big article. For, it was, it was uh, presented in 2019 and published this year. And uh, his article is named uh, A New Arabic Apocryphon from Lake Antiquity, the Quran. Uh, and he, he cl clearly explains how the Quran uh, is sort of uh, a commentary on biblical topics from the 7th century. It cannot be read without having in mind the um, a, a biblical uh, environment um, and, um, and also an apocryphon uh, biblical apocryphon um, environment. There are plenty of references in the Quran to the Bibles and to biblical apocryphons. And so we cannot see the, the Quran as a standalone book. It comes from a context where there were debates among religious people, where the, the people knew about the Bible, knew about some of its apocryphons. And so one can consider the Quran to be a sort of biblical Arabic apocryphon. And I think it's an interesting point of view because it's, it shows us that we cannot take the Quran out of its real, actual historical context, its religious context of the seventh century. And so when we put it this way, this is a huge argument against the Jahiliya, against the standard Islamic narrative, which tells us that the Quran was preached to a people, a pagan people who did not know about the Bible and so on. 
It cannot be when we read the Quran. It is also a book, like a bit like uh, Stephen Shoemaker um, said it, that has many sources, many influences. So if we are looking for an Ur Quran, which means a, a sort of pre-canonical reduction of the text as a book, it is very difficult to, to find it because there are so many different uh, influences in this text. Um, with Thomas, you spoke about uh, Chris, uh, the works of Christoph Luxemburg and Gunther Lulig. Um, both of those scholars proved that the, the Quran has an Aramaic background. We have some Aramaic translation, we have some Aramaic transliteration into Arabic in the Quranic text. But uh, this is only what they, this is the only thing that they proved. They did not prove, per se, that there was an Aramaic text that was translated and it made the Quran. I, I, in a sense, it cannot be because the Quran is made for a part of circumstantial proclamations, which depends on the, um, which depends on, on the circumstances. So the, they, they could not have been an Ur Quran, um, a sort of Aramaic book that was translated into the Quran. And besides, um, contemporary uh, scholars such as uh, Guillaume D and others, who wrote uh, in the Coran des Historiens, the Historian's Quran, which is um, uh, a French uh, book in three parts, three huge books, thousands of pages of Quranic studies, historical studies about the Quran, which was published two years ago. Um, and it is a huge um, synthesis of what the scholars know about the Quran. In this book, we find so so many discoveries by those scholars of the many sources and influences that we find in the Quran. Uh, Guillaume D established that there are there were many 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 sources and influences, Christian sources, Syriac sources, Jewish sources also, and we find them. Uh, for, for example, we have the story of the the people of the cavern uh, in the Quran which is taken from the story of the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Uh, Guillaume D. proved it. It comes from an homily from James of Sarug. There is also the legend of Alexander, which has been sort of adapted into the, the Quran as the, the, the story of uh, Dual Carnine, uh, the one with two horns. We have uh, a very famous um, Christian or biblical uh, apocryphon, which is the Proto Evangelium of James, um, which tells us about the um, infancy of Mary and, and some other Christian traditions that we find in, we find adapted in, in the Quran. There is the Jewish the life a Jewish a story, a Jewish tradition about the creation of the world that we find in the life of Adam and Eve. A Jewish apocryphon, and it is almost the same as the story of the creation of the world that we find in the Quran, with uh, Satan, with Satan being forced to to submit to Adam or refusing to do so, and so on. We, we find this also in Jewish tradition, in biblical apocry uh, apocryphons. There is the uh, Testamentum Domini that we spoke about which is a sort of manual for, of religious instructions for catechumens, for people who, who prepare for their baptism. And we find, we find the almost same instructions in the Quran. So uh, Guillaume D is very, very proficient and he found uh, many, many sources and influences uh, and ancient texts that were adapted uh, into the Quran. And um, in, in the Coran des Historiens, the Historian's Quran, the book I was referring to, we also find in Muriel Debier and David Amidovic's um, article, 
we, 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 they spoke about the um, Syriac uh, scriptures and Jewish scriptures from the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century. And we see that um, the, um, the themes that we find in the Quran are already in those scriptures. Um, Muriel Debier wrote an article about the Syriac apocalypses. Uh, there are many Syriac texts about the apocalypse. And we, we, we have, for example, the story of Gog and Magog and the wall that Alexander is building to contain Gog and Magog. All those stories that we find in the Quran, they were already there in the religious context of the seventh century. And we have texts, Syriac texts, that shows those stories. And it's the same with Jewish stories. Uh, there are many Jewish apocryphal um, texts showing stuff that we find in the Quran. So it doesn't mean that the, the Quran authors copied those texts, but it, mean, it means that there was um, a, um, a Jewish and Syriac religious context full of ideas and we find those very same ideas in the Quran. We, we don't find in the Quran's religious tradition from, uh, I don't know, from Australia or South America, Southern America or Africa. We find the exact uh, influences of the 6th or 7th century Middle East, which also tells us how the Quran came into into the light, how it was made. It was made out of its, of, out of its context. <laughs> and what I want to insist on, as a kind of response to Thomas, is that the Quran is a book that is mostly circumstantial. There are many, many, many um, passages, verses, that depend on uh, historical circumstances. Because as, as we just have to read it to, to, to get it, those passages, those verses, re relate to the specific situation of the preacher and the specific situation of his audience. The, the preacher tells something because he reacts to his audience, for example. It is circumstantial. He reacts to historical events. He teaches, how to, he teaches his audience or he taught himself how to react to critics. He mentions also the, uh, the critics, the, the text mentioned for, for example, uh, there is um, this verse that I um, that I uh, remarked in Surah 17, verse 47. Uh, there is a critic that is uttered, not you follow, but a man bewitched. Which means um, that the, um, th there was um, a reaction to the to the preacher, and the preacher had to react to this reaction, and it all became Quranic text. So we see that, that some, in, some, in some of those parts, the Quran is circumstantial, and so it cannot be taken as a religious book, as a lectionary. And it tells us also that we cannot um, understand the Quran out of its context. So um, this is what I wanted to, to, to present to, um, to you uh, as a sort of general introduction to uh, the Quranic study about the Quran word in the, um, in the Quranic text. Great. But, Listen, thanks so much. This is good. Did a great job of explaining. What are you going to do next? Where are you going to go next in the next episode? I, I want to, 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 to show the audience a Quranic study I made um, about the Quran word in the Quranic text. When you read the Quranic text for what it is, when you read it literally, it makes sense. It makes sense. And, um, but it makes another sense than the one of the standard Islamic narrative. And we will see that the Quran that is described in the Quranic text is not the Islamic Quran. It is something else. It is another book. And so people are getting confused. There is a huge confusion about this. And it is when you don't have the, the good idea, the, the right 
exactly in the right place, it's very difficult to, to understand because you it is it is made to be confusing, kind of. But the Quran in the Quranic text is not the Quran. It is not the Islamic Quran, it is another book, it is an Arabic lectionary. Okay, this is great. Well, you heard it from the man's mouth. That's what's coming up next. So, what is the word Quran in the Quranic text? It comes from the QRA root, Kaf Ha Hamza, and it basically means to recite, to read. So, when we see Quran, it can mean a recitation, a reading. It could mean a lectionary which is a reading, a collection of reading taken from scriptures um, that is made um, <clears throat> that is made to be used in um, in masses, in, in worship, for the prayers. Um, and, and so, Quran, as an Arabic word, could mean lectionary. But basically, it is recitation or reading. There are, in Aramaic, uh, according to the different di dialects, the words Korono and the word Keryana, which means, which specifically mean lectionary. Lectionary, uh, so as, a, as I said, a religious book, a collection of uh, readings taken from the sacred scriptures with prayers, with hymns, which is supposed to be used in a... Um, um, in ritual masses with a ritual calendar. There are 88 occurrences of the QRA roots in the Quranic text, and I've looked at every one of them, and there are 85 out of those 88 that relate to a Quran or to a recitation. In three, the, the three occurrences, the three other occurrences, it's about reading or recitation, but without any relation to a Quran. Um, in Islamic Arabic, because there is an Islamic Arabic language and a non-Islamic Arabic language, the Quran, Quran, is understood as the one and only Quran with a big Q, which is the sacred book of Islam, uh, which is supposed to be the word of God preached by the prophet Muhammad, according to the standard Islamic narrative. And so, Quran, a sort of uh, became um, become a, 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 a proper noun. Uh, Quran is now Quran with a big Q. It is a proper noun. The Quran. There is only one. But we will see that uh, in the Quranic text, there are many, many occurrences of the word Quran that do not fit this explanation. Uh, that, that do not fit the explanation of Quran as being the one and only Quran, the Islamic Quran. And I want also to point that there is something very specific with this QRA root, because there are other other words to describe to, to describe the recitation or the narration. We find in the text the, uh, the verb talar, which means to, to recite, and also kasa, to narrate, or ratal, to recite. But when the word Q, when the QRA root is employed, it, it has something to do with a Quran and a sort of religious text. And we will see which text it is. So, uh, I've looked at every uh, occurrences of the QRA root, and here is a list of the 85 QRA occurrences in relation to a Quran or a recitation in the Quranic text. Uh, there are a lot of them, and from those, uh, all of those occurrences, uh, I have made um, an exegesis. What is an exegesis? It is very basic, very simple. It is to, to look at every occurrence and to look for the meaning of the word according to the context of the verse. And by doing so, you get to know what the word means, what it really means. This is so basic that um, it sometimes uh, is forgotten by scholars who 
who, who don't use this methodology, which is very, very simple, and who rely on the standard Islamic narrative to get the sense out of the Quran. But we will see that the standard Islamic narrative is sort of um, incapable of explaining many verses according to himself. Because in many verses, we find that there were other Qurans. There were many Qurans, in fact, actually, at the time of the preaching. And the preacher specific, uh, specifically focused on a Quran, which is the Quranic text, Quran with a big Q. Um, for example, in Surah 6, verse 19, there is this, say, God is witness between me and you, and this Quran was revealed to me that I may warn you thereby and whomever it reaches. And we find this expression often in the Quran, this Quran, which, a contrario, means that there were other Qurans. You don't say this Quran if there is only one Quran. So there were many Qurans at the time uh, of the preaching. And like I, I tell you, um, we, we find this expression many, many times in the Quran. I haven't quoted every occurrence here. I want to, to, to keep it simple for the audience, but um, it is like this. Um, here in Surah 10, verse 15, we have a reaction of the audience to the, to the proclamation of the preacher. When our verses are recited to them as clear evidences, those who do not expect the meeting with us say, bring us a Quran other than this or change it. Bring us a recitation, bring us a reading other than this and change it. Which means also that uh, in, in the mind of the audience who is reacting, there could be other Qurans. So the Quran is not a unique book, a unique preaching. There were many Qurans. Um, in Surah 25, verse 30, And the Apostle has said, O oh my Lord, indeed my people have taken this Quran, again the expression this Quran, as a thing abandoned. Again, the same. You cannot say this Quran is, uh, is only one Quran. You have to have several, several Qurans in order to, to use the expression, this Quran. The same here, uh, Surah 27, verse 76. Indeed, this Quran relates to the children of Israel, most of that over which they did agree. But this is an honored Quran in a preserved slate, which means, a contrario again, that there could be other Qurans that are not honored. And so what I want to point here is that we find evidence in the Quranic text that there were many Qurans at the time of the preaching. But there was something about a unique Quran, something new. And what we get is that, of course, there were many Qurans, many lectionaries, many recitations of religious teachings at the time of the Quranic proclamation. But the, procl the proclamation aimed at introducing a new Quran, the Quranic text Quran the specific Qur'an that is the issue here. What can we take, what can we get from the text about this specific Qur'anic text, Qur'an? It was an Arabic book. Indeed, we have sent it down as an Arabic Qur'an that you might understand. So this might be why it is different from the other Qur'ans. And thus, we have sent it down as an Arabic Quran and so on. Here in Surah 20, verse 113, in 39, uh, 28, it is an Arabic Quran without any deviance that they may become righteous. Surah 41, 44, and if we have made it a non-Arabic Quran, they would have said, why are its verses not explained in detail in our language and so on. Uh, and there are many, many verses that specifically point at the Arabicness of this Quran. So, and thus we have revealed to you an Arabic Quran that you may want the mother of cities. Indeed, we have made it an Arabic Quran that you might understand. And indeed, and again, 
It's about an Arabic Quran. Uh, it is a revelation of the Lord of the Worlds in a clear Arabic language. So I think you get my point. The Quran that uh, we are talking about, the Quran that is the specific Quranic text, Quran in the Quranic text, is an Arabic Quran contrary to the others. So just that with this very basic uh, sifting of the, the Quran, we, we just understood that the Quran that the Quran is about is a specific book, but one out of many Qurans. And it is a specific book because it was an Arabic Quran, an Arabic recitation, an Arabic reading, an Arabic lectionary. And we will see thereafter that we will find many other clues, many other evidence in the Quranic text that will make us understand what is the Quran in the Quran. Another point of, for, for the conclusion would be when we look at the text, the text is speaking about a unique Arabic Quran, which mm. is different from the other Qurans, which means the other Qurans are not Arabic. So if they are not Arabic, what language? For example, Syriac. If the, those are Syriac Qurans, they are Kiryanas or Koronos, which means they are lectionaries. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think so that the very meaning of the word Quran in the Quranic text is lectionary and yeah. not word divine word of God. Yeah, it means lectionary. We've said this, we've been saying this for years. The word itself is very similar, both between Aramaic and, and uh, Arabic. And as we look in, at that environment, as we put it through the sifter, we're finding that there were many of these karianas, there were many of these lectionaries, these hymns. That's why it had to make a distinction. This is the one that is in contrasting to those ones. It makes only sense. What's the next thing we're going to be doing? Um... Now we will see that the Quranic text gives us evidence that the um, Quran, the Arabic Quran, was already written at the time of the proclamations. This is very important because in the standard Islamic narrative, um, which is all about explaining us how the Islamic Quran was written and, and came um, and came to us. It is explained that the uh, Islamic Quran is the Quran that we find in the, uh, the Quranic text. Every time that we read Quran in the Quranic text, according to the standard Islamic narrative, it is supposed to be the Islamic Quran. And this Islamic Quran was written all along the, the time um, during which uh, Muhammad preached. But we see that in the Quranic text, the Quranic text tells us that it was already written. So it cannot be the Islamic Quran. And this is the first part of the little Quranic study I will try to, to, to unpack here. Um, the best thing will be to, to jump to the presentation and to read the verses. So, in the Quranic text, we saw evidence that the Arabic lectionary we discovered, the Quranic text Quran, was already written, was already done and finished at the time of the Quranic proclamation. For example, in Surah 41, verse 26, do not listen to this Quran. Let me just interject here. Um, what do you mean by proclamations? I think some of your uh, hearers will be confused. I'm a little confused. When you say proclamations, this is when it's the readings, this is when it's the teaching, this is when the preachers are preaching. What, what do you mean by that? When we read the Quran, the Islamic Quran, we see that most of its text, of its text is um, kind of a preaching. It has been preached before. We see a preacher preaching or someone speaking. It, it can be a preacher. The Muslims think it is God. But this is what I call the proclamations. The, the, the Quran was written out of exhortations, homilies, proclamations. 
mostly. So what, let me, just so I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying really is that these before it was written in a text as the Quran that we have today, it was proclaimed, it was preached in their homilies, lectionaries, and hymns that existed. And they were oral. These were oral proclamations. Those oral proclamations mostly. then got written mostly. down. So we're talking about exactly. the time before it gets written down in a codified text. And here, here, this is what the standard Islamic narrative explains. The mm -hmm. standard Islamic narrative explains that the Quran was written out of the proclamations of Muhammad. But it is also what we can gather just by what we can find, just by reading the text. When we, we read the text, we see that mostly it is made of proclamations of people speaking to other people. Okay. Oh, no, the reason why this becomes very important then is this assumes, therefore, that there is no, there is no eternal text that has always existed. You're confronting that right now. You realize that, and you're also confronting the standard Islamic narrative yes, view of uh, a of untouched or no human interventions, accretions or deletions. You're confronting that notion as well by saying what you've just said. In in a sense, but um, you see, when you you look at the text in a scholarly way, in an academic, a scientific way. You, you, you find just what I said, that the text is mostly about um, the writing of an oral, an oracular proclamation. We see someone or maybe several people speaking to others, telling uh, that they should not, uh, for example, eat pork, uh, or that they should do this or not do this, uh, or a, a preacher explaining the story of uh, Joseph, or you see all the Quranic stories. Mostly, mostly the Quranic text is made out of these proclamations, what I call proclamations. There are other kinds of um, texts, other literary genres, which we spoke about in our previous video. We, like I said, the, the Quran is not a book, but a corpus, a collection of different types of texts. Some are uh, oral oracular proclamations, but others, others could, could, could have come from um, a, a written tradition. Uh, for example, the, the short surahs, the apocalyptical surahs from the end of the Quran could have come from um, uh, a writing process and not from an orality process, uh, a proclamation. But those are um, hypotheses, scholars have uh, hypotheses. And um, what I intend to do now is by looking at the Quranic text, by doing an exegesis of the Quran word, the QRA Arabic root in the Quran, is gathering evidence of what the Quran in the Quranic text is. And particularly here, we will see that this Arabic lectionary, because this is what we already established before, was written at the time of the oral proclamation of the preacher. So the preacher could be Muhammad according to the standard Islamic narrative, or other people that we don't know about. Um, this is what the <laughs> what the scholars will will unveil. Mm. So let's go back to the Quranic text and <clears throat> and see. We see that in Surah forty one verse twenty six, someone is speaking about the Arabic lectionary as being something already finished, already written, already done at the time of the proclamation. This is what we can, we can make out of this verse. Do not listen to this Quran and speak noisily during its recitation. One could not speak like this if the Quran was not already finished. And it is the same in Surah 47 verse 24. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran 
or are there locks upon their hearts? So the Quran is something that is already done here. Otherwise, this verse would not make sense. In Surah 50, verse 1, it, we are talking about an honored Quran. So something that is already existing, that is already written, that, that is already there. Again, in Surah 55, at the beginning, verse 1 and 2, the most merciful, he taught the Quran. So the Quran already exists, or otherwise it could not have been taught. Um, in Surah 7, 73, verse 20, so recite what is easy for you of the Quran. Again, the Quran is presented here as something that already exists, that is already written. And if we had made it a non-Arabic Quran, in Surah, in Surah 41, verse 44, when we use the past tense like this, we had made it a non-Arabic Quran. It tells us that the Quran is already made. And the last verse I want to, to point out is, uh, is in Surah 42, verse 7. And thus, we have sent down to you an Arabic Quran. So here again, the Quran is an existing book or an existing recitation. It is already done. It is already finished. It is not the work in process that the standard Islamic narrative tells us about the Islamic Quran. And so we see that the Quranic text Quran, the Arabic lectionary, already existed at the time of the Quranic proclamations. And so it cannot be the Islamic Quran. It is another book. Because the Islamic Quran, the Muslim had to wait until Muhammad died to write the Quran, to write the Islamic Quran. Because they had to wait until the, 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 last, um, the last words of Muhammad, the last proclamations of Muhammad to write the, the Islamic Quran. But in the, in, the, in the text, we find that the, the, the Quran, the so-called Quran of the Islam, of the Quranic text already existed. So it cannot be the Islamic Quran. It is another book. And what is this book exactly? We already saw that it was an Arabic uh, lectionary. And we have evidence again in the Quranic text that this Arabic lectionary, this Quranic text Quran, was a lectionary of previous sacred scriptures. In Surah 10, verse 37, it is written, and it was not for this Quran to be produced by other than God, but it is a confirmation of what was before and before it, and a detailed explanation of the book about which there is no doubt. And here we have the word in Arabic, kitab. Kitab we translate it with the word book, but it is not really a book per se. Kitab means scripture, what, what has been written down. And so here we see that the Quran in the Quranic text explains what is in another book, another kitab. And this kitab is something very special, very particular. It is the kitab about which there is no doubt. What is this kitab? What are those scriptures? They are from the Lord of the worlds. What scripture existed in the seventh century that were supposed to be from the Lord of the worlds in the Middle East? There were maybe the Zoroastrian scriptures, the Avesta, for example. There were the, <laughs> the Bible, of course, the Gospels and the Torah and the Prophets and the Psalms and so on. And so here, if we look at the text for just, just for what it, it, it says, without the Islamic narrative telling us that it is a book, a book, a book which is uh, on a sacred uh, tablet uh, by God and so on, one could guess that the Quran is a detailed explanation of the sacred scriptures of the 7th century. 
and I think it is about the Bible. And we will see that in many other verses of the text, it is the same. In Surah 12, at the beginning, from verse 1 to 3, Alif Lamra, these are the verses of the explicit book. What is the explicit scripture at the time? <laughs> the, the verse gives us the answers. The verse gives us the answer. The answer, because it, it is just here, written down for, for everyone to see. We have sent down a lectionary in Arabic that you may understand. We read to you the best of story, and the best of stories is the story of Joseph. It is a story that we find that we find in the Bible. And here we understand what the Quran is about, what the Quranic text is about. Here we are, here we have someone featuring an Arabic lectionary which presents the best of story from the best of stories from the Bible. And here it is about the story of Joseph that we find in the Bible. And in the following verses, in Surah 12, we will have the story of Joseph. Someone commenting, telling, commenting the, the story of Joseph, the, the biblical Joseph, and telling his Arab audience about it. And another verse in Surah 15, verse 1, these are the verses of the scripture, the book, the kitab, and a clear Quran. So here we have a preacher telling his audience that the verses of the scripture that he is about to, to tell his audience in the following verses are kind of the same that the, the one that we can find in the clear Quran, the Arabic lectionary. Again, we have here evidence that the Arabic lectionary, the clear Quran, featured the verses of the Kitab, of the scripture of the 7th century, the sacred scriptures of the 7th century in the Middle East. In Surah 27, verse 1, again, it's, kind, it's almost the same. These are the verses of the Quran and of a clear book, a clear scripture. The same explanation. The Quran, the Arabic lectionary, is, is kind of the same. It features the same verses that, um, than the one we find in the clear scripture, the Bible. It is, what is this scripture in, in Surah 41, verse 3? A book whose verses have been detailed, an Arabic Quran for people who know. Again, here we have evidence that the Arabic Quran, the Arabic lectionary, is a collection of verses from a previous sacred scripture, a previous kitab, and I think it, it is the Bible. And here we have the hardest evidence uh, of all the evidence we can find in the Quranic text. By the explicit scripture, the clear scripture, it's the same word, clear and explicit, we have made it an Arabic lectionary for you to reason. It is taken from the mother scripture with us, sublime and full of wisdom. So what is the Arabic lectionary? It is something make it, which is made out of the clear kitab. And it is taken from the mother kitab, Um al-Kitab. And here we have the Arabic, the Arab, uh, Arabic preposition fi. Fi is uh, usually translated by in. It is taken in the mother scripture. But the, this, um, this Arabic word has the meaning of from in it. When you ask uh, Arab, Ar Ar Arabic um, speakers, you see that the fi has, oh, carries always the notion of um, a container, something that is from something. It is not in here, it is from. So it is taken from the mother scripture. 
Um al Kitab, with us sublime and full of wisdom. And what is the mother scripture? What is Um al Kitab, the mother of scripture? We have an explanation here in in um, in the op oh, Surah 56, verse 77 to 79. Indeed, it is surely a noble Quran, a noble Arabic lectionary taken from, and again, with the same, pre, the same um, Arabic word, fi, taken from a scripture well guarded, none touch it except the purified. And Jay, do you know who has to purify before to touching a, sac a certain sacred scripture? Of course, it is the Torah. According to Judaism, you cannot touch the Torah if you are not purified. And I think we have here evidence that the Arabic lectionary, the Quran that we find in the Quranic text, was a lectionary of the Torah and maybe of the Gospels also. It was a lectionary of previous sacred scriptures that existing at the time of the 7th century. It was an Arabic lectionary made from excerpts of the Bible of the sacred scripture, Torah, Gospel, and maybe other texts. Uh, and so it is not to be confused with the Islamic Quran. We have here clear evidence that the Quran word in the Quranic text is not the Islamic Quran. It is something else. It is another book. And thanks to our study, we are now starting to understand what this other book is, an Arabic lectionary which was a collection of sacred script, uh, sacred uh, of verses taken from what was considered at the time the sacred scriptures, the Torah, the Gospels, and maybe other other books, other religious books. <clears throat> but let's go on with our Quranic study, and we will see that in the Quranic text we have also evidence that this Arabic lectionary was being taught to the preachers by some unknown teachers. In Surah 10, verse 94, So, if you are in doubt about that which we have taught to you, revealed, but it is a kind of the same word as taught, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. So, who is this we here? Who has taught something to the one that is preaching? Here we have maybe the, I think so, the, the, the it, it is about a teacher teaching a preacher and telling him, if you don't know, if you have questions, ask the people who have been reading the scripture before you. If you have a question about our teaching, ask the Jews or ask maybe the people who have been reading the scripture before you are the people who are teaching the preacher. So who are they? This is the question. In uh, Surah 41, verse 44, and if we have made it a non-Arabic Quran, they would have said, why are its verses not explained in detail in our language? Is it a foreign recitation and an Arab preacher? Who is speaking here? This is not the preacher speaking here. This is someone else. This is not the preacher telling the Arab audience. This is, I think, the teachers telling the preacher about their own doctrine. The teacher were the one who translated an Aramaic Quran, a foreign Quran, into an Arabic Quran. And they gave it to the preacher to teach, in order for him to, to teach the Arab audience, in order for him to present it to the Arab audience. This is what we find here in this verse. In Surah 15, uh, I have uh, here a few a few verses, uh, 87, 90, 94. We have certainly given you 
seven of the repeated or seven of the repetitions of the great Quran. There is a great Quran and it is being taught by someone or by some people to the preacher. They have certainly given the preacher seven of the repetitions of the great Quran, seven of the passages of the great Quran. Just as we descended, those who separated, those who have made the Quran into portions, so proclaim of what you are commanded and turn away from the associationists. Here we have the, we have the teachers telling the preacher what the um, teaching is about. And I think it is so, so clear and evident, but the thing is people mostly read the Quran with the standard Islamic narrative glasses on the nose and they don't see the evidence hidden in plain sight. In Surah 40, in Surah 75, verse 16 to 19, we have some instructions given by the teachers to the preacher. Do not move your tongue, move not your tongue with it to hasten with it. You will not hasten, it is about the day of judgment here. You will not hasten the day of judgment by preaching, preaching it faster, preaching it again and again. Indeed, upon us is its collection the gathering of the verses from the sacred scriptures into the Arabic lectionary and its recitation in the Quran. So when we have recited it to you, then follow its recitation, then upon us is its clarification, its explanation. This is the literal meaning of the Quranic text here. <clears throat> Some people will tell me it is not what we find in the Islamic, Islamically correct translation, but it is the literal meaning of the Arabic text. And in this text, what we find again evidence that there were teachers who taught the preachers the Arabic lectionary. And here we have a sort of um, a sort of a brief, a debrief of the, the teaching lesson, of the lessons that they were um, doing, they were making for the preachers. And in verse, in the Surah 76, verse 23 to 24, indeed, it is we who have sent down to you, sent down is a bit like taught, we have taught to you the Quran progressively, so be patient for the command of your master, of your rabbi. It is the Arabic uh, word rab here, which is the same as rabbi, rabbi, master. And do not obey from among them a sinner or a coverer. It is the KFR root, which we already spoke about in previous videos about the coverers, the misbelievers as being the rabbinical Jews. So here again, we have a teacher telling his student what, uh, what he should do. He, is, he has to be patient for the command of his master, of his teacher. He has, he, he has to obey him and not obey the sinners, not obey the rabbinical Jews. Why? Because the teachers, the masters, are the ones who, who know the Quran, who know the Arabic lectionary, and who teach the Arabic lectionary to the preacher. And I think we have here evidence that this Arabic lectionary was taught to the preacher by some teachers. So who, who were those teachers? This is the question here. Um, I have here other verses apart from the Quran um, uh, occurrences, apart from the QRA Arabic root, showing evidence of 
the existence of the Arabic lectionary and its teaching process. Those are very well-known verse, but when you read it now, once you have understood what I just explained, it becomes very, very clear. In Surah 11, verse 13, they say, He has fabricated it or forged it. Say, then bring, produce ten surahs like it that have been fabricated and call upon whomever you can beside God if you should be trustful. And now we understand what, it, what this means. It means that the preacher who was preaching to the Arab audience, who was proposing to them, who was proposing them, <laughs> he was not proposing to them, who was proposing them to adopt the Arabic lectionary, he met reactions, he met opposition. Some people in the Arab audience told him, your Arabic lectionary is crap. We don't want it. You have forged it. It is not from the sacred scripture. It is not from God. And he, he answered, so you just have to bring me 10 surahs like it, 10 chapters like it, 10 Arabic chapters like it. <clears throat> and, and we will see, we will judge. The preacher tells his audience, my Arabic lectionary is really taken from the sacred scripture. It is the actual real translation into Arabic of the Aramaic sacred scriptures. If you want to challenge me, then do your own translation into Arabic and we will see who is better. We will see which lectionary is better, my Arabic lectionary or your translation. So it is not here about the, what the standard Islamic narrative says about this um, divine challenge of making something like the Islamic Quran. It is much more peculiar, much more simple. Uh, it is about the Arabic translation of the sacred scriptures that we can find in the Arabic lectionary. In Surah 16, verse 103, and we certainly know what they say, it is only a man who teaches him. The tongue of the one they refer to is foreign, and this is in a clear Arabic language. So here we have evidence that there were at least one teacher or several teachers that were teaching the preacher. And we have also evidence here that those preachers were not Arabs. They spoke a foreign language. Which language was it? I think they spoke Aramaic because it was about translating an, an Arabic, an, um, the sacred scriptures, the Jewish sacred scriptures into Arabic. And so they spoke Aramaic. And here we kind of understand who the teachers were. In Surah 76, verse 23 to 24, we already saw those verses, but I have to, I want to, to give a new explanation here. Indeed, it is we who have sent down to you the Quran progressively. So be patient for the command of your master. Here we, we now understand completely what it is about. There were some masters. They taught the Arabic lectionary to the preachers. And there were, there was, so there was a kind of um, pact or something. There was something between Aramaic speaking teachers, Aramaic speaking masters and Arabic preachers. And lastly, in Surah 25, verse 4 and verse 6, those who cover, so the rabbinical Jews, say, this is a falsehood. He invented it. And another people, another tribe, another group, assisted, it, assisted him in it. But they have committed an injustice and a lie. And they say, tales of the former peoples which he has written down and they are dictated to him morning and evening. 
So here we have uh, an opposition from the rabbinical Jews, who are called coverers, kafirun, to the um, explanations of the Arab, Arabic preacher. And those rabbinical Jews tell that the preacher had the assistance of another group, another people, so, so someone different from them. We, we know now that the people, the teachers, the masters who taught the preacher spoke Aramaic. But they were, and, and also that they were Jews, they belonged to the Jewish people. But they were not part of the rabbinical Jews, because the rabbinical Jews here just, tell, just told that they were another people, so not another group, that they were not part of their group. Also, they talk to the group of the teachers as being the former peoples, the groups from before. So they were something ancient. They belong to an ancient community. They were not a, a new community that just emerged in the seventh century. They were um, an old group. <clears throat> And also here we have evidence that the, um, the, what the, the, the preacher is preaching does not come from God because it, has, it's, it is dictated to him morning and evening. Here we have evidence of the teaching process. We have evidence that there were teachers teaching the preachers what to preach. So, what we can what can we understand from all of this? That there were, there was a specific group that was a Jewish group, but was not a rabbinical uh, Jewish group who taught Arab preacher an Arabic lectionary in order for the Arab preachers to present this Arabic lectionary to uh, an, an Arab audience. I think this group wa was the Judeo-Nazarenes that we already spoke about, that we, we also, <clears throat> and that we also established the, um, the existence thanks to the Quranic text itself. Remember, Jay, we had some videos about the people of the book, Al Al Kitab, and the Quranic Nazarenes. And if we link our Quranic study about the Quran to our previous video, I think we can say that the teachers of the preachers were Judeo Nazarenes, and that the Judeo and the Judeo Nazarenes were the one who translated an Aramaic lectionary into Arabic and that they taught some people, some Arabs, to, to, how to preach this Arabic lectionary to the Arab audience and that those preachers became the apostles of the Judeo-Nazarenes to the Arab audience. There were the envoys of the Judeo-Nazarenes to the Arab audience. Envoy in Arabic is Rasul. And they were not so Rasul, I think, does not mean God's envoy in, in some cases, but the Judeo-Nazarenes envoy. Um, I think we, we should um, finish our Quranic study here because what we just established is groundbreaking enough, I think, for our audience. And we will see in another part what we can make out of all of this and how, thanks to this new evidence, how we can uh, fathom the emerging process of the Islamic Quran, because we have now established that the Quranic text Quran, the Quran word, the Quran that we find in the Quranic text is not the Islamic Quran. 
And so, what is the Islamic Quran? Well, this is good. Now, what you have done here, this is interesting because you're, you're looking at the Quran itself. You're un opening up the Quran and saying, what does the Quran tell us? Where mm -hmm. does it claim it derives its material from? And you've done a good job of going through reference after reference. You gave us a lot of references here. And they all are referring to something in the past tense, which means these are things that have already happened. These are material that is already exists. Uh, you talked about chapter 46, uh, chapter 47, chapter 50, 55, chapter 73. You went on to get a whole litany of reference after reference after reference about a previously existing text. Previously means it happens before. Another book, another collection, a previous scripture in chapter 10, verse 39. You refer and you specify we're going to that this is not just any text. It is the kitab. Kitab as you as you are uh, defining it, is a scripture. That means it's a religious text. Uh, they talk about another text in chapter 10, verse 37, chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 27, 41, 42, that they are taken from the mother of the kitab. And it's interesting how you took the word fi, which uh, is uh, always in my, in, which always means in, that I've understood it. And I looked it up while you were doing it, and it is in, in the text that I have, the Hilali and Khan. It has taken in, uh, in the uh, book, taken in the book. You've put to from a book. Uh, and you say, this is a better, tra more correct translation. Thus, it's taken from a previous, from means pre previously, a previous religious book taught the one that was taught previously you referred and these are verses we know chapter 10 verse 94 chapter 21 verse 7 41 verse 44 these are ones that we always have referred to uh about the previous text we've always said that that is the bible itself you're saying no these are lectionaries because we have revealed them to you is uh we have made them for you we have given them to you we have recited it we have sent down to you all these, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have. This is something that has prepared, been prepared for them. These are things that have been given to them. And now they're receiving them. And then you go on to chapter 11, chapter 16, chapter 76. There's so many that you gave us referring to that these that they have been given are now to be made into an Arabic text for the Arabic people. And if you have... If you have any doubt, pr provide me something, 10 verses that can supersede it. This is the, the claim of uh, create a surah like it that I've always had thrown at me. Referring to, I had those te references to produce a surah like it actually is saying something that can be equal if you, uh, in Arabic to what we have been giving you. You get a better Arabic. In other words, it's a competition. I'm going to give you a better Arabic translation of what was given to me. And so there's already that internecine competition going on between the Arabists as to what is going to be derived, what is going to be the final copy. Arabic. Great stuff. So here the Quran speaks for itself. And all you have done is just taken those verses. You've given us a litany of verses to chew on. We're going to use it now. And this is good because that then leads up into the next question. What then and what then became? What then became the Islamic Quran? What was this Quran that was the final the product that came from these lectionaries, these homilies, these poems, these oh, beautiful oh, hymns? What then became that Quran? That's what you're going to go into next. Thanks so much. This has been excellent. I, I just want to add something here. I haven't cherry picked some verses that fit my explanation. This is not my method. What I did was looking at every verse, every Quranic verse where there is a Quran or a QRA root. And this is what I got from the whole of the text, not a cherry picking um, collection of verses. So you see, I'm, I'm open to contradiction. I'm really okay with contradiction, um, with people telling me that we, we, we could explain this verse this way and this verse this way. But when you look at the whole of it, when you look at all of the occurrences, I think my hypothesis, the, the, the one I just uh, explained, is the better one. I think also, Odun, with the understanding that you're, we're now coming into it from a completely different presuppositional base, Previously, whenever we looked at these verses, as and I'm guilty of this as well, we've always assumed the standard Islamic narrative was correct. 
So we always took the standard Islamic narrative and we imposed it on these verses. And that standard Islamic narrative starts from the premise that this is an eternal book that is there to that is superior to that which has come before. That which has come before would be the Old and New Testament. So we've always assumed that narrative is what these verses are. What you're saying is, let's now look at these verses again, the same verses. Let's read them as they are. But instead of imposing the SIN onto it, instead of putting the standard Islamic narrative onto it, and here's what you get. And you've done a great job of, it, of unpacking it. Thanks so much for that. Uh, this is the first time I've heard this kind of material applied to these verses in that context, and it makes absolutely good sense. Over to you, Odan. Let us know what you have to say. Yes, this is um, another part in our Quran series. I, I want to unpack some, some material about the, the making of the Islamic Quran. Um, in order to to have the the last piece of the puzzle, so it's very it's very simple. It's all, we most of it we already know, but I think by looking at it from a, a global point of view, it will uh, shed some light on the, the making of the Islamic Quran. Yes, the the thing with the um, the, the the Islamic Quran that we already know of is that it was made from notes and drafts. It was not written as a whole, for example, by a prophet, but it was made um, in, a, in a sort of editing process. And the um, standard Islamic narrative already tells us this. It tells us about the gathering of makeshift writings and makeshift support. And uh, here I have an uh, an, an image of a, a, a shoulder, a shoulder blade bone, a camel shoulder blade bone, um, on, on which uh, someone has written some Quranic verses, and we all know of this tradition in the Islamic, uh, in the standard Islamic narrative, of the gathering of makeshift, makeshift support, so bones. Um, this is all some, found some, in some... Al-Buhari, Al volume 6, hadith number 509. So if you want to look at Al-Buhari, exactly. book number 61, yeah. volume number exactly. 6, hadith number 509. In, in, according to the Islamic tradition, Muhammad is supposed to have uttered the very word of God, and his followers had it written on makeshift supports. And this is strange. How, how come they did not write it on manuscripts? Uh, how, how come they did not respect the word of God? I, I think maybe it was because it was not Muhammad's proclamation that was written on those makeshift support, but other, um, something, something else. And I think there, those were instructions and notes that the preacher Muhammad or other preachers had written for themselves in order to prepare their proclamations. And so it was not the word of God, but it was the preparation for all the exhortation, all the proclamation that the, that the preacher that were taught by the Judeo-Nazarenes, um, that those preachers um, preached to the Arab audience. And I think this, this story about the makeshift writings uh, is a sort of um, memory remnant of what really happened when the preacher, when the preachers prepared their, um, their, their proclamation. And this is what they left behind them when they died, when uh, the story took place. And the only Arab, Arabic writings that the Arab had were those notes, were those notes written on makeshift supports and they gathered it to make to have a sort of arabic um, sacred text uh, another another clue another it's not really a proof those are only clues but another clue is the scriptio defectiva which which means the defective the scripture the defective alphabet of the first quranic fragments for example, in one of the oldest manuscripts that we found in San, that was found in Sana, 
which is the GAM0127, uh, we, we see that the, the writing had no diacritical marks, no vocalization mark, and that it was a sort of defective um, scripture, which is called in, in by scholars uh, scriptio defectiva. And why was it so? We already uh, spoke about this, Jay, in a previous video. Mm -hmm. I think um, those manuscripts were copied from maybe those makeshift supports. They were copied from drafts and notes. And so they were intentionally intentionally written um, without the diacritical marks, without the vocalization, because there were notes that were only supposed to be read at, um, by, by the person who wrote them. But they were copied and copied and re-recopied nonetheless. And I think this is why we have those first Quranic fragments without the diacritical marks. It is also a clue to tell us that the first writings, the very first writings, so before the first Quranic fragments, were not writing of um, a proclamation that was supposed to be the word of God, but they were um, writings made by the preachers themselves in order to prepare their proclamations, to prepare their homilies, their exhortations. I'm just going to show real quickly, you can see, this mm -hmm. is um, from uh, Asma Hilali's book on the Sana'a manuscript, where she shows mm -hmm. and gives examples of the defector. This is the underscript, this is the palimpsest, this is the lower script that was defective mm -hmm. in many respects. You can see it is... Uh, it does not agree with the upper text that you can that you can see written there on the screen. The upper text has has there's a I think there's only about sixty to seventy verses that are in the lower text, and from those sixty verses that are in the lower text, there are seventy differences in script in the defective. But even the defective mm -hmm. script itself that you're referring to did not have the diacritical marks or the vowelization to know what they're being said. But just between those two layers, the fact that there was such a div divergence. And what was she kept on reminding the, the audience is it gives instructions proving that this is exactly. for students. Which what this you're saying, you know, the instructions that she's giving is not, oh, so you're going to bring that point up now. So I'm yeah, exactly. In, in the very first Quranic fragments, thanks to Dr. Ilali's work, but also to François Desroches' work, uh, work and others, Hadia Gortman. Hadia Gortman is um, the scholar who, who recomposed the undertext of the Sana manuscript. We saw that in, th in this text there were teachers' instructions, and it is very, very odd. In, in God's word, according to the standard Islamic narrative, there, there, is, there is not supposed, there, there, there is no uh, instructions. God does not give instruction on how to preach his word. What we find in those uh, very, very old manuscripts are teachers' instructions. For example, at the beginning of Surah 9, we find here in the in the red square here the instruction la takul basmala you do not say bismillah you do not say in the name of god and i think this one and many others that dr ilali pointed out in in a book uh, are instructions of a teacher a sort of master teacher who teaches is um apprentice preacher how to preach how and but how to preach what we already talked about jay in your in our previous video how to preach the arab audience um about the arabic lectionary and so this is um uh, um I made this very, very simple uh, slide here to show that there are many converging clues to tell us, who, which, who, to which, tells, which tell us that um, the, the, um, the material out of which the Quran was edited 
part of which the Quran was made by the caliphs, was not the um, writing of Muhammad's preaching as being the divine word of God, but it was the, um, the there were the, um, the um, drafts and notes that the preacher uh, made themselves to themselves for themselves in order to preach the Arab audience how to adopt the Arabic lectionary we already talked about. So this is um, just a very, very short um, presentation about those converging clues toward the, um, the origin of the, um, which tells us how, how the, the, the Islamic Quran was made. Well, listen, thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Odon. This is good. This is exciting because what you're doing is you're actually, for many years, those of us who have been following the Sanaa manuscript, Al Fadi is doing his doctoral thesis on the Sanaa manuscript, and he has uh, taken on board what uh, Esma Hilali has said. She's very emphatic that we cannot say the lower script has anything to do with the Quran. These are nothing more than schooled texts. That's how she puts it. These are students' writings. What you're saying is, no, these are not students' writings. These are actually the teachers' writings. These are teachers putting in there and explaining how is it the lecture is to be read, how, it's, how is it to be recited. In some ways, we do that in churches even today, don't we? Uh, where you have reference. This is where the preacher speaks. This is where the, the congregants speak. It tells you where it to speak, where not to example, speak. For example, yes. And uh, to say, therefore, that this is nothing more than school text, as Asma Hilali uh, seems to shut it off. Therefore, it's not the real Quran. And no, what she's missing is what you're saying. And that is, if this is the case, that these were taken from bone stones and other pieces of, 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 uh, of artifacts that were at their disposal, which the Islamic traditions say is exactly where they took it from. Abu Adi mentions this in volume six. Then you can say. Then you can see how this process is going along. They the, here are the lectionaries. They're written in Aramaic. They've got to pre produce them for the Arab speakers. The mm -hmm. Arabic speakers don't sp understand Aramaic, so these are instructions to help them along to show them how they're to not only recite it, but they're also then to use it in a very public and oral context. Well done. Good stuff. Now for the next video, we're going to actually put bring it all together. Are we not? Exactly. I think we. We have gathered all the, the pieces of the, the puzzle and, and now we have enough material to, to, to get the, the, the whole picture, the big picture of how the Islamic Quran was made okay. and what it is actually. We explain um, some very complex issues and still there might be some, some confusion um in the head of your audience and i hope that this uh, little comic strip will help them understand the big picture uh, of how the um, the quran was made the islamic quran was made yeah. so let me share my screen and I, I want to start with the first step of this uh, process of the making process of the islamic quran the first step where was the Judeo-Nazarenes. They were the teachers of the Arab preachers. There were this uh, very, very small Jewish current that believed uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, but he was a political Messiah. And they believed that they could trigger his second return, his second coming on earth, uh, and so they could trigger the apocalypse by conquering Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple and um, restarting the, um, the sacrifices and Moses' religion there. What, what then they, they had a plan to do this. They wanted to, to, to make an alliance with the, their uh, Christian, the Arab Christians, the uh, neighbors, and to benefit uh, from their military help. And in order to, to get them into the project, they took their sacred scriptures, their kitab in Arabic, their sacred scriptures, I think it was the Torah, it was maybe a bit of the Gospels, but it was um, 
it, it might have evolved in the Judeo-Nazarene context into a Judeo-Nazarene sacred scripture. They also had other scriptures and they made an Arabic lectionary, a Quran, so in Arabic, out of those scriptures. And they wanted to present this Arabic lectionary to their Arab neighbors in order to, for, for them to join the, the, their project of the conquering Jerusalem and so on. And so this was the first step, the Judeo-Nazarene translated in, into Arabic some of their sacred scriptures and they made, they so made an Arabic lectionary, an Arabic Quran. Then those Judeo-Nazarene <laughs> Uh, taught some Arab preacher. We don't know whether there were one or several preachers. We have clues that tells us that maybe, maybe there were several preachers. The uh, standard Islamic narrative, of course, tells us that there was only one, but it also tells us about false prophets, other prophets who prophesied something uh, besides Muhammad. So maybe there were several, several preachers that were taught by the Judeo-Nazarenes. So they told, they taught the Arab preacher about the Kitab, their sacred scripture here. And they told him, they, they taught him the Arabic lectionary, the Arabic Quran. And together they made notes and instruction for proclamations and sermons. And the Arab preacher wrote notes, the Judeo-Nazarenes wrote notes, and in those notes, it was about the sacred, sacred scriptures of the Judeo-Nazarene, the Torah, the Gospel, and it was also about the Arabic lectionary, because the, um, the preacher, his main goal was to, to, to present the Arabic lectionary to, the, to an Arab audience. And this is what he did. <clears throat> with the Arabic lectionary, with his notes and drafts, and also with other notes, in, and with the help of the Judeo-Nazarenes, he addressed an Arab audience and told them what he had in his notes. He told them about the Kitab, which means the sacred scriptures, the Judeo-Nazarene sacred scriptures. He told them about the Arabic lectionary, the Quran, the Arabic Quran, and we see that in the Quranic text, sometimes he also address, addressed Jews, people of the book, but mostly he addressed an Arab audience. And we can, we can gather from the Quranic text itself and also from other sources that this Arab audience was Christian at the time or had been Christianized already Christianized. <clears throat> what happened then? When the um, Arab conquest took place, when Jerusalem was conquered, the Messiah did not come back. And so the Arab who took Jerusalem got rid of the Judeo-Nazarenes, got rid of the sacred scriptures, got rid of the Arabic lectionary, and got also rid of the Arab preachers because they failed. They failed at their project. They failed at having Jesus come back in Jerusalem. And so the Judeo-Nazarenes and their Aramaic texts and the Arabic text, which is the Arabic lectionary, were kind of eliminated around 640 up until the Umayyads. And what, what remained then? What remained was the Arabic notes and instructions for the proclamations, the former proclamation and the sermons. Those were the only Arabic texts that remained. And then someone, a caliph, or I don't know who exactly, someone had the idea to gather all those Arabic notes and instruction and to make a book out of it. And he made the first Arabic mushaf, the first Arabic book. 
it was not the Quran yet, not the Islamic Quran yet. It was a religious book uh, in Arabic that was a sort of symbol for the Arab leaders of this time, a symbol that they also had religious writings, that they also were legitimate, as legitimate as the Christians and the Jews who already had religious writing. And you see that in this book, the, the book talks about the Kitab as being the Judeo-Nazarene um, scriptures, and it talks about the, uh, <clears throat> the Quran as being the Arabic lectionary. And thereafter, when Islam emerged as a religion, the Arabic Mushaf was made into an Islamic Quran. It was kind of the same book, some corrections were made, some interpolations were made, but the major change was that the, the Kitab, the Kitab was uh, now identified as the Islamic Quran itself. And the Arabic lectionary was now identified as the Islamic Quran itself, leading to a big confusion in the text and leading to the difficulty we have nowadays to identify the, what the Quran means in the Islamic Quran, what the Kitab means in the Islamic Quran. Because the Quranic text Kitab and Quran words became understood as the Islamic Quran. And now you get the whole picture, the whole process of the, the making of the standard Islamic uh, narratives, Quran. This is how I think the Islamic Quran was made out of the sacred scripture from the Jewish, from the Judeo Nazarene, made into an Arabic lectionary, made into notes and instructions for proclamations and sermons. Those notes and instructions were made into a book and <clears throat> because of this, this book speaks about a Quran and a Kitab. And when Islam was made, the, um, the, the, um, the sacred scriptures and the Arabic lectionary, the Quran, were given the same sense as the Islamic Quran. And so we have nowadays what the standard Islamic narrative tells us uh, about a, a very, a very strange book, the Islamic Quran, which talks about himself as a book. There is, um, when, when, you, when you look at the Quran according to the standard Islamic narrative, the Quran talks about himself as a book being already done, being already finished, as he talks himself as being a kitab. He talks about the Muslim as being the people of the kitab, the people of the book. And it is very, very confusing. And I think it is one of the reasons that the, the scholars, the academic scholars, have had such a difficulty understanding the Quran because of the confusion, because of, of this uh, genius idea of the one who made the Islamic Quran to transform the Arabic lectionary into the Islamic Quran and the sacred scriptures into the Islamic Quran. So, this is my, 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 my sort of comic strip explaining, uh, explaining the, um, the making of the Quran. I hope it is clear enough for, for your audience. But Jay, as you know, I will be very happy to answer any question in the comments and, uh, and to answer any of your questions. Well, no, this is excellent. Um, in fact, just leave it on this because this is just so the people can see uh, rather than uh, unpack, uh, uh, taking off the screen. This is good just to leave it there. And I think you've, you've done a, a wholesale summa summation of everything you've done up on the Quran in just one page. So I would suggest that people take this that they're looking at right now, grab it off the screen, print it off, memorize the six steps. It's six steps that Odin has done here. 
Uh, it's like a meme. This is like a, a cheat sheet, a crib sheet. <laughs> and Muslims also look at this. Can you then understand why so much of the confusion of all these phrases, all of these references, they're all in there. It's all there. The difficulty is we don't understand from in the seventh century the environment from which it is derived. You have helped us do that, Odin. Thanks so much for putting it into the seventh century and showing us if you're going to understand what these what the Quran is really saying, for heaven's sakes, go back to the seventh century and see from where it is taking its material. This is nothing new. It's all lifted material. It's borrowed. It's plagiarized. In many respects, it's been bastardized, unfortunately, the final product. But the germ that is there can be understood once you read it for what it is. Don't stop imposing the standard Islamic narrative onto it. Stop taking sin and imposing onto it. Just read it as you have. You've done this in six steps here, showing us how the Judeo-Nazarenes waiting for Jesus to return didn't do so, had all the material there, were trained and bring it down from Aramaic down into Arabic so the Arab speakers could understand it. And then all of a sudden realizing that when Jesus didn't return, it was for naught. And so it was left just percolating until the Abbasids took a hold of it. And once the Abbasids took a hold of it, they needed not only a man, they needed a book and they needed a place, the book, the man and the place. And that's why the book then became almost sacrosanct, put up on a pedestal. And then all the other materials surrounding not only who this man was, but also what, where it was to be read and how it was to be read. And then later on in the later centuries, it then got lifted up to be almost sacrosanct and almost divine in and of itself. So um, fascinating. That's a great way to put it so we can see it's visualized so that we can actually use it. Thanks so much, Odin. This has been a great help. Terrific as usual. Thanks so much, Odin. Mm -hmm. Great to have you again. Just um, an another word, uh, uh, Jay. Um, for, for those who want it, they, they can download it from my website. From my website. Okay, of now course, they can take a, a screenshot of your video, but uh, it will be available as a PDF file and as a picture on my uh, website, thegreatsecretofislam.com. Good to have you back, Odin. Thanks so much for your work. God bless you in your continued you, work. Get us out this English book so we can understand it and uh, so that we can use it. Until next time. This is Odin and Jake, 6,000 miles apart, over and out. <music>